So this is, uh, I've returned, as you can see, from uh, ever since the end of the winter's retreat, I've been uh, traveling about and uh, totally exhausted. <laughs> so I'm glad to be back, actually. <laughs> to recover from all the excitement of my life. Uh, going to all nice places, went to Paris for a week, and then to Thailand, and then Russia. And it's so good to see the interest and in the, you know, in the Buddha's teaching. So Russia was always a place, you know, for most of my life was uh, kind of the the place that was where the communists lived. That were there's always this you're American, you're brought up to to uh, regard the communism as something very bad. And so I remember during the Second World War, the uh, Soviet Union was. Uh, an ally of the United States and Britain. And then right after the war, almost immediately after the bombing of Japan, it, suddenly they told you it was the enemy. So you had, a, you had to, you know, and I was about 11 or 12 then, so trying to figure out how your best friend, which is considered Soviet Union and Stalin, and kind of best friend of the United States and suddenly overnight becomes the en the enemy. These are things that, you know, baffle you when you're growing up, the, the way the world moves and changes. And then uh, <clears throat> from that time on to the time where the Soviet Union kind of collapsed, uh, it was a total surprise to me because there was this illusion that that Soviet communism was going, it was like a fungus or cancer that was going to take over the whole world eventually. And it was up to the United States to kind of slow it down, to, to keep resisting so the Vietnam, Korean, North Korea, Korean War, Vietnam, and things like that were, were justified. This is the propaganda anyway, the, the party line that I grew up with. And so, it was a big surprise when it kind of just collapsed internally. Because I remember during the 1980s here and in the UK, we were all expecting a third world war between the Soviet Union and the United States with Britain and Germany as the battlefield. This is what Ronald Reagan said. He said he could visualize, foresee a third world war between the United States and Soviet Union, and Britain and Germany would be the battlefield. Now this naturally upset all the British, <laughs> and no doubt the Germans. So. And this was a kind of, <clears throat> you know, information, uh, rumors, and that that one receives through the media, through popular paranoia, fears, and suspicions. So when the Berlin Wall was taken down and the Soviet Union imploded, then this was, I think, most of us, a big surprise. Because this, this sense of invincibility. Now, we're going to Russia now. Now it's the economy is booming. Uh, I was there about two years ago, and, it, and even in two or three years that have passed, it, you go to Moscow, and the, the traffic is the worst I've ever seen anywhere. 
is so uh, in the traffic jams. <laughs> it's uh, almost impossible to drive a car through Moscow in, in these days because uh, I mean, unless you want to spend your day sitting in a traffic jam, because the economy is booming and people are buying big cars and huge, you know, like these big Chevrolets and uh, these real um, heavy, heavy duty jeeps and whatnot. So you can see that on the material level in, in some ways is, is, is growing and there's a lot of alcoholism and you, can, you know they seem to go together the, just the materialist dreariness of uh, say Soviet communism and then the, then the materialism of a free market economy it has no soul, no nothing to live for, and so people, you know, their their lives become more and more meaningless. Now, the religious path is is one where we, you know, most of us have this sense of there's something much more important than just material wealth or. <clears throat> the, trying to set up the perfect political system and a flourishing economy and all, all the rest that the, the attempt to perfect the material world uh, the, the social world trying to make it uh, what we think it should be uh, we begin to realize that it's not the way it is that that um, things change and we'd have not that much control over how they change and how we, how it goes, which way it goes to the right or the left or straight on. But we do know that everything's changing. So this is a, you know, in terms of Dhamma, the Buddha emphasized this: sape sankarani cha. All conditions are impermanent. Now I know most of you would agree with that statement: all conditions are impermanent. But you realize. You really know what that means, taken to its ultimate. You know, and this is, you know, we, we think we understand Buddhism because we, we get the idea, we go agree and say all conditions, or we recite Sape Sankarani Cha, and we think we understand it. But do you really know how far to take all conditions are impermanent? And so, even in a Buddhist monastery, we create enormous amounts of suffering because we still want things to be the way we'd like them to be or don't want them to be the way they are or whatever. We're caught in in these, uh, this, this conditioned, the conditions that, that we, we identify with. The identity with the conditioned realm, with the sankharas, is quite, you know, it's, it's, it's everything. It's, uh, it's, we're afraid of letting it go, of, of losing it, because you can't imagine what it's like, literally, you can't imagine what it's like to let go completely of all conditions, subtle or coarse. It's beyond imagination. Uh, when you when you really just if you're caught in trying to figure it out with your imagination, then you end up more with a kind of annihilationist picture. You know, everything is ceases, all is impermanent, and and uh, they end up with the kind of total annihilation. But that's why it's so important to recognize the 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 thinking process to be able to. Observe thinking, no thinking, rather than try to think your way into enlightenment. Because you'll never be able to get enlightened through attachment to even the best Buddhist concepts cannot take you to enlightenment. The thinking process is conditioned, it's bias, it's habit, it brings up emotions, our own particular reactions to words and concepts. So like communism, you know, I remember uh, when I was a university student, uh, 
in the early 50s. Uh, I entered the university in 1951. That's ancient history for most of you. And so, remember then, in the McCarthy era in the United States, that, you know, communism was the word that that sent us all into spasms, quivering with fear, because I uh, remember I wrote, I was always a bit of a radical in my attitudes, and and I tend towards nonconformity, so just because the United States was so anti-communist, I tended to be more sympathetic. So uh, I have that kind of nature, and if what everybody else likes, I decide I like, uh, or what everybody decides is bad, I decide well, maybe it's not so bad. So I have a contrary character. But they, anyway, they... Uh, I wrote an essay on something of supporting communism, and my professor told me, she said, uh, it's a good essay, but I want to warn you, you could go to, you could be, uh, go, go to prison for that. <laughs> it scared me, you know, because just the word communism, the way to ruin somebody's life totally, as they did during that period in the United States, just say they were communists, even if they were never communists. You could destroy somebody's career or reputation. Just create that suspicion that so-and-so is a communist. Now, in reflection, we observe this, you know, how now it isn't such a, you know, communism is no longer the enemy. So one can be more kind of philosophical about it. But say, if Fifty years ago, that wasn't the case. Sixty or fifty or forty years ago. Well, these are the power of concepts and words. How that, you know, we don't even know, who knows what communism really means. You know, except that, uh, you, you know, when you're young, if you don't, you're just told that it's evil or bad or wicked or wrong deluded, and we easily adopt these, these uh, perceptions, unless we try to awaken to the way it is. So mindfulness meditation is to awaken consciousness, to, to be the knower, the observer, rather than the one that, that uh, rebels or believes or resists or aligns or, you know, whether you with any concepts whatsoever, whether they're philosophical, religious, political, because they are mere concepts. So another concept was like the word Siberia. Now, to most of us, they say Siberia is a place you go for punishment. We think of gulags and and, uh, you know, the worst place in the world we find is Siberia. <clears throat> so the place that most nobody wants to go and live, that you're sent to f to be punished, is Siberia. So I just came back from Siberia two weeks. <laughs> By choice, it wasn't, uh, but no one was trying to punish me. <laughs> and the KGB didn't send me there. I chose. I wanted to go there. Because another fascination, some place that has, you know, I didn't really believe that anyway, even though, you know, the, the terrible stories about Siberia, I didn't really believe them. So, anyway, I had this opportunity, but Sister uh, Tita Mehta uh, and the Russians uh, that invited me offered me this chance to uh, have two week holiday in Siberia. Now, how many of you would choose Siberia as a place for your holiday? Because the word itself is, uh, you know, conveys this, uh, this negative sense, place, huge vacant place that's de usually cold, that uh, is unlivable, is unpleasant, uh, painful. And yet the reality of this time of year, anyway, is very beautiful. And Lake Baikal is... is uh, this lake uh, in the very uh, 
eastern part of Siberia, just north of Mongolia. And uh, this area is called Buryatia, which is a Buddhist republic. So in Russia, what is known as Russia today, there's a Buddhist republic called Buryatia. And that is on the eastern uh, side of Lake Baikal. And Lake Baikal is an enormous lake, very deep. It's the deepest uh, freshwater lake in the world. And of course, it, it hasn't been ruined yet. It's still the water. You can, you can take your cup and put it into the lake and drink the water straight off. Is that clean? And it's not been developed yet. They're busy now. The President Putin has made it a, an area to develop for tourism. <laughs> so uh, in a few years, you, you go there, you'll find all kinds of resorts, big resort hotels and whatnot. But uh, now the, the roads are absolutely terrible. <laughs> Cars that go bump, 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 for, you know, no matter how short the distance, it seems to be incredibly long because of the, the bad uh, infrastructure, the, the bad roads that are now existing there. But they're busy uh, building new roads, improving it. Change, isn't it? So Richard Smith, who uh, went with me, you know, he's, uh, we all were commenting on this perception of Siberia. And even Venerable Venita told me that in Sri Lanka, they use Siberia in the same way. <laughs> it's a place you send somebody to punish them. <clears throat> So the Buryatia is uh, the the main uh, the the main town is in the where we we flew from Moscow to the town the main town in Buryatia called Ulanude, and Ulanude has the biggest bronze head of Lenin in the whole world, an enormous head of in the town square incredibly big head of, not the rest of him, just his head sitting there, <laughs> decapitated, I guess, uh, in, the, in the center of this town. And so you see, you still see Len statues of Lenin everywhere, but not of, uh, you don't see uh, Stalin or Marx. But, uh, and also, you realize in Russia, the Russian Orthodox Church has come back with a vengeance. They're, um, they're very powerful now, and they're not very tolerant. Uh, so they, you know, they've, I've heard uh, there's a Thai monk living in St. Petersburg who's uh, related to Tanjokun Panyananda in Thailand, Ajahn Chatri, and he, he, he studied in St. Petersburg for about n nine, ten years now and has a PhD from the university. And so he's also trying to establish a Theravada and Vihara in St. Petersburg. So he purchased this house, which is outside the main city of St. Petersburg, in a village inhabited by gypsies. So all his neighbors are gypsies. And, <laughs> and then uh, the house he bought was built by gypsies. And now what that concept does to your mind, when you say gypsy, and, um, and, the how, and if it was built by gypsies, you know, <laughs> you see the power of words, like the word gypsy, you can say, in, in, when I grew up, it was, gypsy was more of a romantic concept. You bring out the gypsy in me, or would like to be a gypsy, free from, free from responsibilities. And yet, the reality of gypsies is, is, you know, when you're living near them, they're not, it's pretty rough going. <clears throat> you lock, suddenly lock all your doors. 
But anyway, the, this, this house is quite a big house, uh, and he's trying to renovate it into a Buddhist vihara. So it's a, a, a kind of enormous project uh, and that he's taken on. But there is considerable interest in now the, in meditation in in cities like Moscow and St. Petersburg because you find it's very much like it is here. It's usually like the um, middle class elements, educated middle classes that seem to gravitate towards especially like Buddhist meditation. So most of the people on the retreat were like Psychotherapists or teachers, nurses, doctors, people of, of you know in the in the professional world, most of them. Well, it's interesting to to uh, you know consider what is you know the, the middle classes because you find this in the United States and here in Britain or European countries, the ones that tend to to incline towards Buddhist meditation are usually. You know, we usually put in that category of middle class. Now, here in Britain, that middle class is, is, is quite is much more narrow than when an American uses the word. What um, what you'd consider working class here, a lot of it would be considered middle class in the states. <laughs> it's, it's not. You don't even know how to use the words because. You know, I, when I use the word middle class, how, how you actually receive that concept. And of course, my nature is to be more sympathetic with the underclasses, the underdog, you know, the, the poor, the needy, the working classes. Uh, uh, my, you know, have this kind of altruistic uh, personality. And so the idea of... of ministering to the middle classes is not particularly inspiring to me on the level of, you know, of being of service. My altruistic nature is not inspired by being a teacher of the middle classes. Where you kind of, you know, Mother Teresa worked with the, in the slums of Calcutta. And these are the inspiring figures. But Ajahn Tomato, a nice middle class life here in England. Travels uh, business class on airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he goes to places he stays in usually, you know, lately, my, bar me, my good fortune is people put me up in the best hotels and whatnot. So this wasn't always the case. I used to be a uh, kind of, what do you call it, Tudonga Bhikkhu, where you lived under your cloak and mosquito net. But then idealizing is another thing. You know, like if one can see the, the, the problem, the suffering of grasping ideals and concepts of any sort. But then you recognize that, that one thing, and this is just my view anyway, of, of say this this this, this uh, category of middle class people, it's, it seems to be a state that, that when which you have enough to recognize that just that many people begin to realize that just having money and material possessions and education is still, people suffer. You know, middle class is not the answer toward, towards uh, freedom from suffering. So you can also see that even if you become the upper classes, the privileged ones, the aristocracy or the royalty, is still still not the answer. Is it? If you know people, wealthy people, or people in the aristocracy or the royalty, they suffer just like anyone else. And this suffering then is the is the first noble truth. So this is common to us all, you know, whether you, no matter what political system, what class you belong to, what gender you are, what uh, ethnic background you come from, what religion you belong to. 
as long as we are attached to sankharas, blindly attached, with no perspective, no insight into the nature of sankhara, but committed to our thoughts, our ideals, our views, our emotional habits, our perceptions, that kind of blindness, even even with life at its very best, under the best conditions, is still, the suffering is still uh, experienced. Because this suffering is this ignorance, this blindness, which is always creates this sense of separation and division. Now, when you attach to ideas and thoughts, perceptions, when you have prejudices and preferences, that always, you know, that, that very blind attachment to views and opinions, to prejudices or preferences, that always creates this division in your mind, in your conscious experience of life. You're creating, they're the good ones, I mean, we're the good ones, they're the bad ones, we're right, they're wrong, we're better, worse, and uh, as we, you know, create these these views about uh, you know, comparing which is the best, which is the worst, what's right and what's wrong. <clears throat> now with intuitive awareness, mindfulness, this is the only way out of this of this of this, this conditioned realm. If we if we don't cultivate, develop awareness, then we are stuck in this in the in this division, in this separation this feeling of separateness. So that's the real dukkha, or suffering, that is the first noble truth. This feeling of separateness, isolation, loneliness, something missing, something, something lacking. Either we, we think it's something lacking in oneself, or we think that it's due to the society, or the family we're from or the because we haven't had all the best opportunities that we think we should have we can we can always blame our suffering on other people or on or on other conditions or we can take it very personally like i'm just not good enough now all of that is based on thought on concept on on attachment to views and opinions, to ideas, to perceptions. The sense of a separate self, me, is, is an illusion we create through ignorance and attachment. So I create myself as a, as a personality through attachment to my views, my preferences, my, my identities, my memories, my fears and desires, I create, uh, my personality is conditioned from these attachments. Then we're easily intimidated by words. You know, how we, we f fear or somebody says something or you, it's a, nowadays here in Britain, everybody's trying to be politically correct. PC is an obsession where, you know, you can hardly say anything strict, very directly <laughs> because you're going to upset somebody. <laughs> and so we try to, to use language so it doesn't upset anybody uh, because in the power of words, you know, we, we can be offended or upset or uh, angry or enraged or indignant by words that people use. Well, that is habit, isn't it? That's that's conditioned habit. You know, to, we're conditioned to to think and to identify and to prefer and to make judgments and criticisms. So we're we're caught in these habits, identified, blinded by the conditions, the thoughts we have, the the attachment to memories views and opinions. Now the way out of that then is awakened attention. 
And so this is this is why I assume most of us have taken an interest in Buddhist, Buddhism and Buddhist meditation or in monastic life. Like monastic life itself is a convention to develop awareness. Like Maria taking the eight precepts, it's, she's going to use a kind of traditional convention, an agarika, uh, for a year to not for identity, I hope. <laughs> because they all look the same, don't they? <laughs> They're not here to kind of express our individuality and our unique uh, qu- uh, character or special qualities, but to uh, the main purpose whole purpose of a place like Amravati is for to remind us, awake, pay attention, observe, be this knowing, not the judge that says what's right and wrong or good or bad, but the awareness, this awareness of our own thoughts and preferences, fears, greed, hatred and delusion, is not to get rid of it or to annihilate anything but to understand. So this is the insight into the first noble truth, it's understanding dukkha, understanding suffering. It was interesting seeing the the biggest head of Lenin, you know, a decapitated in the nobody, just the head, yeah, on a kind of marble plinth, and Ulan Ude has quite nice buildings in it, kind of the kind of Soviet type architecture, and uh, you know, with nicely cut grass and gardens and whatnot. And it's springtime, so we saw there's a lot of wildflowers and beautiful. Uh, you know, everything looks quite abundant and. And then when the, in, the, in the sunny weather, it was a very splendid kind of uh, visions of blue skies, white clouds, big lake, blue lake, deepest lake in the whole world. And uh, we lived in, uh, in the kind of uh, places right by the sea, by the, by the lakeside. In fact, one place I had a, uh, my room was right, you know, just a few feet from the lake itself, Lake Baikal. Well, these are kind of wonderful opportunities to enjoy the natural beauty. But still, it's not enough, is it, if there's not awareness. One, one merely is, is distracting oneself if one isn't developing or cultivating a w- awareness. So the, the main, you know, through the traveling uh, to these places, these faraway places, exotic places, it's not just for distraction or excitement or whatnot, you know, it's, it can be just for that or for awareness. When you're in a country where nobody, hardly anybody can speak English, they're all talking away in Russian. You know, you watch your own frustration, trying to communicate. When Ajahn Panyasaro and I were in, in Sibsongbana in South China a few months ago, we, just to, to try to get hot water from the, from the, uh, Chambermaid. <laughs> That's frustrating. Say, oh, I, I forgot how to say hot water in ta- in uh, Chinese. Nobody could speak Thai or English. You know, we depend, you know, so much on language and and, un- and trying to understand each other through concept. But on the human level, the the um, the 
mindfulness doesn't that doesn't isn't dependent on concepts or language. It's it's the transcending of language itself. Language and thinking, these are habits, acquired habits. They are conditions changing. You know, so they you can observe the thinking process as something that's changing. Then you're observing it in terms of Dhamma. Whatever you think, whatever you feel, uh, you know, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant, right, wrong, good or bad, it's, if you accept it, if you understand it, then it's, you recognize it's changing. It has no, nothing to sustain itself. It has no essence, no real substance to it. So that the, the constant factor in one's life throughout the four postures and uh, movement and aging process of the body is awareness. This is, this is the stillness of the unchanging. So in the, in the um, reference to there is the unborn, ati bhikkhuwe ajatang, there is the unborn. Now to me this is a fact. This is not an abstract philosophical concept. Now this is, we say what is a fact? What, what is, is, not, is not, so not created by me, not, not something supposed or some ideal or vision created through thought. So awakened awareness Intuitive awareness is our ability to awaken in the present. This is a fact. Awakenness is like this. Mindfulness is like this. And, it, and it, it, the thinking process stops. This is a fact. This is the unborn. This is reality. Where the, the conditions, if you, if you just get fascinated with with their qualities, then you're caught in the in the reactions, whether you like or dislike or approve, disapprove, want or do not want. You're you're whirling around in the realm of desires and preferences and opinions. So in in awakened awareness, attentiveness in the present, then this is the gate to the deathless. This is the, this is the, the crack in the samsara. This is the, the way we can get out of the, the whole mess, is by paying attention. And so the Buddha's teachings are, the teachings to remind us of this. They're not for grasping in themselves. They're not doctrinal positions or metaphysical assumptions. They're not dogma or doctrine. So this, this uh, Four Noble Truths then is taking something ordinary like suffering because it's through our willingness to accept, to know dukkha that we are free from it. If we're constantly trying to get rid of it and resist it, then we're constantly recreating suffering in our lives no matter how good you might be, you still are, are caught in the basic movement of, of the changing conditions. And the conditions don't change the way we want them to, they just change the way, you know, they, it's what arises ceases. So you can't sustain a condition. So it's what we want uh, all the time. If you notice it has its peak, Change, you know, you have the arising and then the ceasing, the birth and death. So we have peak moments where everything is what we like, but then it changes. You can't sustain peak moments of condition experience. But what is self-sustaining, where it's not me trying to sustain anything, but letting go of, of, uh, of all conditions all conditioned phenomena. 
And recognizing, realizing that non-attachment, non-self is, is a fact, is reality. This is not some philosophical assumption. I just try to imagine the unconditioned or the unborn. You can imagine anything conditioned and born, can't you? You can imagine forms and, and uh, you know, whether they're fantasies or based on memory or whatever. You, we can create fantasies. They're all about forms. Uh, we have uh, kind of, uh, you know, we have memories of things, of glasses and cups and temples and floors and builders and whatnot. These are all forms. Or we can live in a world of fantasy, create our own world of fantastic images. But to imagine the unimaginable. So this is, this is where mindfulness is this ability. This, this is a natural state. This is not a created state. You don't create mindfulness. You can't create it. You awaken to it. You recognize it. So then, the, then there is this, this banya or wisdom of knowing, direct knowing. This is not well, I think, and maybe, and could be, and might be, uh, it, or Buddha said, or whatever. It's none of that anymore. You're beyond the only, all the suppositions. Because you know through direct knowing, not through believing in what somebody tells you, or what scriptures, how you interpret the scriptures. So this is a very uh, a marvelous thing. It's so simple. It's so it's ultimate simplicity, and that's why it's difficult for us, because most human beings were so complicated. You know, simplicity is beyond us. If it, you know, we we go into computers now, and and internet and everything, because just there's endless complications. Because there's so many, there's so many fascinating conditions that we can uh, distract ourselves with. But awareness is not complicated. And yet we may not recognize it or realize it. Even though if we were never aware, we would probably be dead by now. You know, it's survival also. But this is awareness with wisdom discernment. So it's not just depending on self-preservation out of kind of uh, prime, primal uh, emotions that, that help us to survive in the, in the jungle. But it is, uh, you know, it's a natural state of being. It's reality. It's not abstract idealism. So when we chant this, there is the un, unborn, uncreated, unformed, unoriginated. You say, ati bhikkhave ajadang aputang akadang asankadang. This is a fact. Now, I don't ask you to believe me, but uh, what I'm encouraging you to do is to test it out, to find it. You have to know this, not not just quote me or scriptures from Pali, from the Pali Canon. This is to be re realized. This is reality. Then from that, from the unborn, ajat dang, we have perspective on the born. Jati. Birth. That which begins and ends, in other words, on sankharas. So ajat, ajat dang is like the unborn. You can't imagine that. You can't. Your mind will just. You can. You can abstract it. You can create 
abstract ideas about the unborn. But that's still a creation, isn't it? The more you think about it, analyze it. It's not like it, it's here and now, so you don't, you don't need to, to analyze or, or uh, think or try to figure it out. It's just awakening to it. It's this. It's this reality of now. There's nothing complicated except the complications we create out of ignorance. So this, you know, this is a, something to really treasure in your lives, this opportunity to cultivate, to, to awaken to life. It's not just trying to get rid of suffering and, and, and find happiness. That's Buddha, Buddha didn't teach a way of just trying to find happiness and get out of everything. His point at the way things are, the, the conditioned realm is like this. And its very nature then is unsatisfactoriness. You can't ever be satisfied with the conditioned realm. It's not, it's un, because its nature is unsatisfactory. So don't look for satisfaction in what is unsatisfactory. It's ridiculous. <clears throat> and that's what people do, isn't it? They're looking for satisfaction or happiness in things that, that are, their very nature is changing. So even though you have momentary happiness, maybe, through being successful or getting what you want, it's unsustainable. You can't, you can't sustain that kind of happiness. It's very ephemeral and dependent on other conditions supporting it. Where the unconditioned isn't dependent on anything. But it's reality, and it's here and now, and it just, this opportunity is to recognize it. And over the years, this, this recognition becomes very strong. You know, if you keep pursuing it, and in everything that happens to you, good or bad, right or wrong, if you keep pursuing it, if you keep observing, witnessing, reflecting, then more and more your confidence increases or your faith, your sadha or faith or trust in the Dhamma increases. Because this is some, when you know something for yourself, then, then it's no longer a matter of speculation or probability. Or, and, and when you create yourself, Notice how your ego, the sense of your separate self, is always full of doubts and self-doubts and, and uh, fears and, and uh, you know, seeing yourself. What do you think of yourself? You know, when I think of myself, there's no refuge in, in my ego. It just takes me into doubt and I, I just, you know, when you're my age, you... You've just created, you know, you've lived with your ego for so long, bored with it. It's boring. My ego bores me to death. So I don't believe in it. You know, it's been saying the same crap for years. <laughs> so it, you know, it doesn't, you know, I can try to improve my ego a bit, which I have due to the holy life. But it's still, even my egotistical moments at their best are still, you know, they still bind me to this realm of samsara, to the realm of suffering. And it's only when I trust in this awakened attention that that dissolves, that's gone. So it's interesting in traveling in Siberia, in bumpy roads, we got on a plane from Moscow to Ulan Ude, and, and um, it wasn't a very nice airplane. <laughs> and you know they 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 put as many seats in until you're kind of 
when you've got a big body like I have, your knees are up by your chin and you're kind of cramped in this in this seat. And uh, and then you have, if you go to the toilet, uh, the toilet was terrible, you know. It a, and it's a five five hour, six hour flight from Moscow to Ulan Ude. And, uh, but then, you know, one can see this as, you know, uh, complain about it, but, you know, training myself to observe my own kind of re- reaction to it. Just recognizing that the way, the way emotionally I feel about it or, and not make it into a problem, not try to say I shouldn't feel this way, but just recognizing that when these conditions are present, this is what, this is the feeling that arises, the emotion that, that I'm recognizing. But in that recognition, it's a letting go at the same time. It's through recognition, you're actually letting go of the perception. And then in, uh, you know, the, the various, uh, you know, things that happen when you're on bad roads, all the, the discomfort or the inconvenience, it's all is part of, the, of, you know, of a mindfulness practice. If you develop it, cultivate it, you're not dependent on, on things being, you know, the way that I like, the way that I would want them to be, but... Mindfulness is never uh, precluded by the conditions that you're experiencing in the present. You can, you know, you use whatever is happening. You know, whether it's pain or discomfort or emotional uh, despair or negativity, fears. It's all Dhamma, in other words. We're seeing the Buddha observing, knowing the Dhamma or the truth of the way it is. Now this is the great gift of the Lord Buddha is, is uh, saying the way it is. He's not saying the Buddha isn't telling us how it should be. The way it is. And uh, I think living in with somebody like Ajahn Chah uh, you know, helped me a lot because Americans are very idealistic. We're full of ideas of how things should be. That's the culture, is to, is to, you know, want to make everything the way it should be, according to an ideal. And the way it is, is, is you know, if you, if you develop your, your conscious experience through clinging to ideals, you're set up to be disappointed in your life, because life isn't an ideal. Life isn't ideal. Uh, there's no ideals that you can cling to. And if you do, though, you're going to be disappointed with them. But noticing the way it is, and then this is Dhamma then, the truth of the way it is, and this simplicity of all conditions that arise are subject to ceasing, birth and death. That's a fact. All conditions are impermanent. Whether they're fantasies in your mind, you know, totally crazy fantasies, or very uh, intelligent observations, whatever, you know, they might be, whether they're crazy or, or clever or whatever, that all that is subject to arising is subject to ceasing. And then the awareness allows us to see in perspective the nature of conditioned phenomena, to know it directly. And this knowing then is the personality dissolves. It's not me or mine. It's not me knowing anything. But it's knowing. It's consciousness. It's reality. And it's not tainted by the conditions that, that, that come and go in consciousness. So the Buddha, when he said, you know, wake up, 
the, the word Buddha means awakened. It's simple as that, wake up. And uh, this awakenness is why we have all the problems, you know, personal problems or international problems. It's all coming from ignorance. These wars, uh, ethnic conflicts, racial prejudices, uh, fears and desires, political views. <clears throat> the Pope recently uh, made a statement that you can only be saved through Roman Catholicism. Now that's <laughs> that's not politically correct. <laughs> it upset the Protestants. Well, that's pretty, I mean, I don't know if that's true, that's what I heard. This Pope is always making these blundering statements. And the Pope Benedict. <laughs> and I mean, this is opinion, isn't it? You know, if I should say, you can only be enlightened through Theravada Buddhism. That's an opinion. That's not a fact. So the Buddha didn't teach Theravada Buddhism. The Buddha was pointing at Dhamma, oh, the way things are. So it's a, it's a, an invitation, an awakened attentiveness to, to life itself, to the bodies we have, to the, to the uh, mental formations, the memories, the, the sensitivity we have to live with for a lifetime. We have living in a sensitive realm with a sensitive form. But we can awaken to sensitivity, to the physical realities of our bodies, to the emotional uh, habits that we have. And that which is awake then, this is the refuge in the Buddha. Bhuto tamo sankho. The Bhutang Sarnangachami. So even forming opinions about Buddhism, still, still trapped in the samsara. There's no opinions to hold on to. This is merely an awakenness that that the Buddha was encouraging. Awaken to life. It's not a put down of, you know, everything's impermanent. It's all suffering. That's attachment to the view to the to the cons concepts. You're not using the Four Noble Truths with mindfulness, you're merely attaching to the views that you form from them. Because you can, you know, you, you can form views and opinions about the Four Noble Truths, about what Buddha taught and all that. You can form, you know, very intelligent views or stupid views or prejudiced views or whatever, but they're still views. And so, you know, when you recognize that the the whole reflective style of that the Buddha encouraged was this awakened investigation of reality that isn't coming from a position of any sort from a doctrine from a from any anything other than through awakened attention to conditioned phenomena and as you awaken to it recognize it, then you begin to to notice, to recognize the unconditioned. So this Ati Bhikkhuve Ajatang Aputang Akatang Asankadang. There is the this is a this important statement the Buddha said there is the uh, now this is uh, very inspiring to me, but it, I don't know how it inspires you. But there's there is the unborn Now that, to most people, probably doesn't sound like anything very inspiring. But to me, this is, this is pointing. This, there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unconditioned. So there is escape from the born, the created, the formed, the conditioned. There's a way, we're not just trapped, helpless victims of our habits and conditions. 
because there is the unborn. Now that's, now that's a statement, but it's not a, a doctrine. It's not meant to grasp this, there is, to believe in the unborn is a, is rather ridiculous. But to awaken, when, now that very act of awakening is the unborn. This is a fact. This is reality. This is Dhamma. This is not Buddhism, but it's Dhamma. I mean, the Buddha never taught Buddhism. He taught the Dhamma, the way it is. So we have this this very excellent teaching now, um, Four Noble Truths. You know, so I mean, it's but it, it's something to to really cultivate it, to to make it work for you. So you're not just you know playing around with con- Buddhist concepts again, or or forming views and opinions from grasping the ideas of of the Pali Canon. Therefore, investigation. Therefore to help us to awaken, to see clearly, not to to put us in a position, uh, some kind of special position, a separative, separate from everything else. So when we think, you know, the Roman Catholic Church is the only is the only real, true, unblemished form of Christianity. Fine, it's an opinion, though. And just because the Pope says it doesn't make it anything other than it's an opinion. And and all I've heard was hearsay because I he didn't really I've never met the Pope so whether he said it or not something else. But it does how many people will react to that you know, and form opinions. And we can say all religions we can be magnanimous say all religions are pointing at the same reality, and that's another opinion. And that's, that's maybe a little more kind of grand, uh, ma- uh, magnanimous, than you can only do it through the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> but it's still an opinion. So this is where they, they you know, just realize, recognize this awakened attention, and, 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 be, and recognize it, and appreciate it. This is, something to treasure, to value in your life as a human individual, because it is the way, the way of non-suffering. So I offer this for your reflection this evening.